Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the live broadcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. This is the launch of our 2022 Inclusiveness Index, a project of the Othering and Belonging Institute that's now in its seventh year. My name is Mnet Almadom. I'm an analyst here at OBI. Um, I'll be serving as your moderator for the next hour. I'm really happy to invite you to this event and invite the project's three leads onto the screen to join me in a little bit. They've been leading this project since its inception in 2016. El Sadiq El Sheikh, Samir Gambir, and Stephen Menendian. Stephen is our assistant director and director of research. Samir is the director of our equity metrics program. Hi guys. El Sadiq heads our uh, global justice program. So in just a bit, this crew will give us an overview of the project. They'll be sharing our latest findings, which could be in your inbox right now, um, and will show us a cool interactive feature on the website to easily sort and navigate both this year's and past year's results over time. So towards the end of today's live stream, we'll be having a time for a bit of Q&A and back and forth. So please, you know, as thoughts come to you while we're talking, feel free to drop questions into the chat box. Our moderator will, um, will bring that to us towards the end of the event. We also encourage you to go ahead and visit the project page to check it out for yourselves. Our chat moderator should be dropping a link to that in the chat box shortly. So thank you again. Welcome from all over. Thanks for being here, everyone. So I will start um, with the most basic kind of introductory question. What exactly is an inclusiveness index? Thank you, Emnet, and everyone who is joining us to share the release of our seventh annual index. The Inclusiveness Index is a really unique instrument and tool, and we hope a useful and revealing one. It is a holistic diagnostic instrument that looks at group-based marginality and inclusion across multiple dimensions of difference. So instead of just having an instrument that looks at, say, racial inequality or gender inequality or disability inequality, it looks at all of those things and more. So it takes account of race, gender, sexual orientation, disability ability, and religion. And it does so in multiple ways. So it looks at incarceration, it looks at political representation, it looks at inequality. It's really a remarkable and truly unique instrument. And I think it's hard for people to grapple with that because it, it's so holistic in its approach. But it's more than just holistic. It also measures and ranks countries nation states and U.S. states to see how they rank, where they rank, and how they've changed over time. Because we've been doing this for seven years, we're able to actually see trends and changes in a really powerful way that I'm excited to demonstrate. But let me invite my colleagues in to help answer the question first. Thank you. Yes, any additions? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Emnet. Uh, hi, Samir and Stephen. And I think I, one thing I will add to, to what the Stephen is saying that uh, we uh, intentionally moved away uh, or uh, neglect to account for uh, like the wealth of a nation when we try to measure inclusivity. Because for us, what's very important that is to, to look at policy and laws that uh, further ahead the issues of uh, inclusion and, 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 and just how to see that without uh, uh, considering the GDP of a country. Uh, and, and I think that's one very unique element of our index. Uh, uh, if you look around, many indexes, the powerful one of United Nations, one of the trouble uh, you have there, and we try to uh, overcome that trouble, is when you're measuring the GDP and wealth of a nation. Because that could just put uh, an equitable uh, assessment of a country just because they are wealthy. But rather here in our index, actually poorer country could really have a really uh, uh, high ranking than uh, wealthy or powerfully economic countries in terms of their social policy design and laws. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I just want to add a little bit to uh, what Stephen El Sadiq said. Uh, we all have multiple identities. And when we assign a single identity to an individual or to a group, it can lead to othering. So what inclusivity or inclusiveness index does, it actually 
respects and values those multiple identity, identities and related differences. It actually ensures that the historically and currently marginalized communities are valued and they are brought into the society and ensuring that the fundamental needs and rights of these marginalized groups are actually uh, met and their needs respect to the, uh, you know, the dominant groups are met and respected. So I think our inclusiveness index does that. And as Al-Sadiq and Stephen mentioned that we are, we are trying to track the, the level of inclusiveness within the US states and the uh, nation states in the global context. Thank you all. I'm, I'm really appreciating this point of the multiplicity of identity and kind of thinking about the breadth of identities in this index and moving beyond just kind of like state level, nation state level um, success. So that takes us to our next question to, to again, kind of think about how these data points express lived experiences for people in terms of marginality and inclusion. What does this index reflect in terms of real stories, real cases that might come to your mind um, as you have gone through this process over the years? Well, it's this tool is, we hope, more than just a measuring stick, but also an advocacy tool. So that if you're living in one of these states that maybe is performing poorly or in the middle of the pack, you can use our instrument to see why, to see, okay, we're doing really well on gender and we're doing decently on race, but we're doing really poorly on disability. That's where we need to concentrate our efforts. So our hope is that this tool can reveal that and then become uh, uh, um, an instrument for pushing for change. Definitely, thank you for bringing in the advocacy angle into this. Did any additions on in terms of that, that impact um, in real terms for people in terms of marginality and inclusion? So th thanks y'all for kind of setting that general overview and giving us a sense of um, what this tool is. But I think since it is an interactive tool, let's go ahead and check it out. I know, I think Stephen, you'll be able to do a screen share and be able to present this year's findings and, and let us check it out um, together. Okay, let's see if this works. Let <laughs> me know if y'all can see this. Looking good. Let us know in the chat if you're following along. This really is a remarkable interactive tool. <laughs> we don't think it's enough attention. And hopefully this demonstration will show you just how remarkable and useful it is. So this, when you go to our page and you click index results, this is what you'll see. You'll see this index results. There'll be a paragraph on how to basically use it and overview of the project and then the table. And the table is organized. You can go to the global table or the US and you can also select the year. So let's start off by looking at the United States. So the United States is ranked, if you scroll all the way down, it's ranked at 72nd in our 2022 index. So you can see here that the United States is ranked on each of the domains. It tells you the specific ranking of the United States, which is not very good on each of these categories. So you can see, for example, that on race and gender, the United States is actually 123rd and 128th. <laughs> not good. And then you can see the overall score, but here's where the magic happens. So when you click the United States, you'll see an overall dashboard of the country. So it has the inclusiveness level, which is medium and a five category gradient, the population, and then it has all of the indicators that go into the United States. But before I show you the indicators, let me show you the index trend page, and then we'll go back to the indicators. So what you can see here is the changes in the US ranking over time since 2016, since we launched this index. So the United States, when we launched this index was ranked 23rd, and then it fell in 2017 to 69th, and then it rose in 2018 to 59th, and then back to 68th, and then in 2020 to 65th, and then in 2022 to 72nd, and sorry, in 2021, where it's it's been stuck in the middle of the pack. But it's more than just the index. You can also see all of the subdomains. So the United States, when it started out, was pretty in the middle of the pack, pretty um, in the median, moderate on gender, and has since fallen off. And 
where the United States has really performed poorly is on the general population score, which we can talk about later what goes into that. It actually does pretty well on disability um, relative to other countries and is in the top 10, pretty top 20, pretty consistently on sexual orientation and LBGTQ inclusion, um, which doesn't really speak great for the world, but it's it's decent in that. And then what you can do is you can go to the indicators. So the United States, one of the best indicators, uh, the worst indicators rather, and what really drags down the United States is incarceration. And you'll see that across the board. So incarceration rate in the United States, this is the world average. And you can see where the US is, where this is really bad. <laughs> this These needles that you see, these pins on each of the indicators is the world average. And the United States is either above or below the the average. Sometimes being above the average is a good thing, like a political representation, but often it is a bad thing, like it is for incarceration. Um, so um, I'm going to show you also incarceration here, right? The United States is one of the largest incarcerators in the world. We incarcerate, what this shows is we incarcerate 629 people out of every 100,000 in our population which is very, very, very bad. <laughs> um, and so this is really useful. We're also on refugees, we're not really great. Refugees scale is here, we're below the world average in terms of admitting refugees and refugee resettlement. This is not true when we started the index. The United States was actually above the world average and you can go and see that, that change over time. So this is one of the remarkable things that you can do for every country you can see what goes into it. And you could also re-rank any of these. So let's say you're really interested in race and you just wanna see race rankings. You can click race here and re-rank the whole index. So you can see all of the countries that are ranked first on race. There's a tie for race um, up to, I think about, yeah, there we go, up to about 36th. And then you can see, you can see how things rank. So you can rerun the index for whatever you're interested in. And you can also reverse rank it so you can see the lowest ranked first. And then, of course, you can do the exact same thing um, for um, the U.S. So I'll show you I'll show you one U.S. state that has actually well, we'll, we'll wait to show this. But, um, but this is just just to give you a flavor of how interactive and amazing this tool can be for really giving you detailed data and helping you see how states and US and, and countries perform. I'll stop there. Definitely, thank you, Stephen. It's it's cool to see the comparative power of the tool and how easy it is to, to always have kind of that reference to a world or state um, average at the same time. Would anyone want to add to, to that? Anything you, in looking at this maybe for the hundredth time <laughs> that you might want to add um, that you're noticing from the display? Uh, sure, I'll add a, a few comments. Uh, one is that uh, you see the different indicators that Sion was uh, showing and also different uh, hu uh, human dimensions that we have captured, race, ethnicity, uh, gender. What we did to actually come to this level of visualization is, is that we created a, a data matrix of all the human dimensions and the domains against which we are trying to capture all the indicators. And within this data matrix, there are potentially 36 indicators. But what we have now is we've used 17 indicators for the US index and 15 for the global. So we have worked with what we have right now. So this data matrix is like uh, Mendeleev's periodic table. We have all these potential indicators, some are missing. And once we have data on those missing indicators, it'll be a complete index. It'll get added and make this inclusiveness index more robust. That's amazing to think about that, that long-term visioning to be able to continue expanding the tool. Any additions on this? I know we'll, we'll get more time to, to play around with the tool, but thanks for, for that demo, Stephen. Um, so we've talked a little bit about this, but just, and Samir, you've kind of touched on this, but I'm curious about maybe how you determine which groups to measure inclusion for and which indicators to use. How did you come to these, these categories? Definitely. Um, as Steve was, was mentioning at the beginning and Al-Sadiq as well about the definition of inclusivity, 
we really wanted to identify the um, you know the subgroups in the population who are uh, historically or currently marginalized. So we identify those identify those groups at the beginning, and we said, how do we determine the um, the level of inclusion? What kind of uh, you know domains we need to capture? So we looked at political representation. We looked at anti-discrimination laws. We looked at uh, our group violence, incarceration, uh, immigration, and th these different domains. Having identified those, we um, you know set forth uh, a set of criteria to determine how do we select these indicators. One of the most important thing to consider was that we we wanted this to be a multi-factor in, uh, index. And the reason being that multi-indicators uh, actually reflect cumulative advantage or disadvantage. So you know, it, it reflects the society in a much better way than you know, focusing on a single indicator, say poverty or income. So we tried to do that. And we, we said we have to kind of try and get as many indicators as we can within this data matrix. Another uh, criteria was to, to be able to scale our indicators from the US to the global uh, so that we, there's some consistency between in, in what we are measuring for the US and for global. Also, we want to make sure that the data is consistently available for, for multiples or countries or substantial number of countries and across multiple years so that we can we are, in the, we, are, we are in the seventh year, and we have tried to do that, keep our you know, data gathering, our data sources consistent throughout these periods. So this was really important. And the last one was that we want to focus primarily on institution policies, laws that reflect inclusivity rather than basing it on you know, the wealth of a nation. And as Sadiq alluded to that, um, you know, rather than making this into a income-based outcome, we're talking about inclusivity. And just by that, there's a possibility of a low-income country to be in the top category of, of inclusiveness. So I think this criteria we set forth has actually helped us uh, look at uh, you know, the comparison between countries, comparison between US states, and just trying to look at uh, a country longitudinally or a state longitudinally or compare countries and states within one year. That's really helpful to, to understand that process and the reliability that y'all are seeking over time. Um, we also didn't talk yet about who who is at the top this year. So would anyone want to to give that that grand reveal right now? <laughs> top state and top country? Sure, I can, I can go ahead, I'll say it. It's okay. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I think uh, I mean, in terms of the US was very consistent for the last five years. I think Hawaii is always uh, continue to be uh, number one. Uh, but in the global context, New Zealand come on top uh, for this year. Uh, and, and, and push away some uh, other country that used to be in the top. But it's still high, uh, uh, rankly very high. Uh, mm -hmm. So New Zealand on the global Hawaii in the United States. Okay, and yeah, you're, you're kind of alluding to this already, but we, over over the years, the order seems to shift a little bit, but you're saying they're more or less remain similar. Um, can you tell us about any general trends you've observed over the past seven years now uh, of doing this? Well, I can I can go, um, and we know that um, using our metrics, one cannot follow a simple narrative of difference between global north and global south. Our our index, despite some of its shortcomings, is still so robust that uh, you know there are, there are different countries that get added uh, to the to the top uh, category of inclusion and, and the bottom. Uh, for instance, Nordic countries uh, have stayed on top for consistently for many years, but there have been additions of you know uh, countries, low-income countries, onto the, um, uh, the the top category, and uh, you know a, a, a global North country or countries into the bottom category. For an example, Bolivia uh, has been consistently been on the top category, which is the high inclusive category 
in all our uh, seven years of our, our calculation, our in, calculating our index. And on the flip side, Russia and Israel have been at the low or the lowest category consistently in the last seven years. Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll add something to that, Emnet. So one thing that's really been disturbing in the seven years in which we have been creating this index is the rise of ethno-nationalism, especially across Europe, but across the world. So India's ranking in particular has suffered under rising ethno-nationalism, Hindu nationalism, religious violence, caste violence. But that's also true in a number of the other countries that we've looked at. And so almost by exception, the countries that have escaped this wave of ethno-nationalism have gradually risen to the top. So in the top 40, you see, it used to be the case, well, I'll speak for globally, but countries like Uruguay and Paraguay and Ecuador are in the top 40. Um, countries that have sort of resisted a lot of these ethno-nationalist tendencies and, and the exclusionary anti, you know, the one of the, the symptoms of these ethno-nationalism is pushing women into traditional gender roles, restricting reproductive rights, um, anti-LGBTQ bigotry, xenophobia, and, and anti-immigration policies. Those tend to be some of the key hallmarks of this tendency, whether you're talking about Hungary or Poland, and, and their rankings have suffered as a result. Um, in the United States, the oscillations have been much different. So we've seen, and I'll, I'll now use this opportunity to share a, a U.S. state ranking. Um, but when we started this index, there really wasn't as much of a pronounced regional pattern. So you would think, you know, that the South, the former Confederate states would be less inclusive. And we, we did see that. But it was pretty much true that there would be within every part of the United States, the Mid-Atlantic, the North Atlantic, uh, the New England, the Midwest, the Plain States, the Mountain West, et cetera, there would be a state that ranked low and a state that ranked high. So you'd see sort of, you know, in the map that we had a gradient where you'd see, you know, there would be at least one Southern state that did really well or one mid Midwestern state that did really well and one that did poorly. We're seeing a lot more, I think, regionalization now where there's more of a convergence across regions than existed in 2016. Let me show you some oscillations by looking at Hawaii as an example. Give me a sec, sorry, you, Ohio <laughs> as an example. Let me pull that up. So let me screen share. Let me know if you can see this. Not just, oh, there we go, yep. So here's Ohio. Ohio is ranked 36th in our index. And again, you can just click the state and you can get all the basic demographic facts. You can see the percentage of people of color, gender, where it's ranking, population, et cetera. And then of course you have all the indicators and you can see sort of where Ohio is relative to the national average. But what I wanted to show you here is again, the index trend. So you click index trend. So when Ohio, when we started the index, Ohio was actually ranked 11th in 2016. And there was a pretty steep drop off from 2016 to 2017. And that drop off sort of continued over the ensuing years. And I'm, I'm not going to say it, but you can go and look and see what happened to the politics of Ohio in that period and how they changed uh, from, from this. And again, there's a data lag, if you didn't know that. So when we report the 2016 index, we're really reporting data that were collected in the preceding years. Um, and Ohio continued to fall off and has improved somewhat, but you can see why if you look at some of these sub-indicators. So where Ohio has really fallen off is inclusion for LGBTQ people. And when we launched, it was ranked 13th and is now, and in 2020 was dead last. <laughs> it's rebounded somewhat, it's now in the middle of the back, but that helps explain this downward trend. And you can look at some of the specific data points here. But this is a kind of an oscillation. And we see with a number of states some of these oscillations. And it's it's hard to explain exactly why, but you can get into the data and hopefully use this data by looking at the indicators to help to help make sense of this. So I'll stop, I'll stop there. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think um, now we've gotten a chance to kind of look at a couple specific examples. Um, we we're talking about the top states a moment, from a moment ago. So I'll turn back to that. So Hawaii is the number one most inclusive state each year. Can we speak a little bit about why that is? Kind of do something similar like the deep dive we just did on Ohio. 
Sure. Uh, rather than show the data, I'll just mention a couple things about Ohio first. I mean, Hawaii. Yeah. So Hawaii is unique in a number of respects. It actually is a, the state in the country that has the largest multiracial population. So in the 2020 census, the fastest growing racial group, if you will, is actually those who identify as multiracial. The United States has a number of states like California and Texas that were major, so-called majority minority in the late 90s or early aughts, meaning that, that people of color or non-white people became a majority of the state population. And this first happened among 18 and under and then young adults and now is, is true for the general population. But the number of people who identify as multiracial between 2010 and 2020 has just exploded in the country. It's several hundred percent increase. It's a very large increase. We're becoming a much more multiracial society. But Hawaii is where this is occurring first and foremost and most visibly. And what that means is that, and social psychologists and psychologists have been studying this, when people, especially children, live and, and play in Hawaii, they're navigating a much more complicated terrain, racial terrain, where some of the stereotypes and simplistic characteristics that are ascribed to race can't really hold because people are both racially ambiguous and multiracial. And so it's just complicated. And so Hawaii does really well, I think, on all the indicators. If you just click Ohio Hawaii, you can see it's at the top in almost everything. But I think it's partly the the distance, rather the the, the non-proximity to some of the the cultural tropes and stereotypes that hold and fix in the mainland are disrupted in Hawaii. And there's, of course, a whole colonial history of Hawaii, which we don't have time to get into, but it really is its diversity and multiculturalism and multiracial um, landscape that plays a large role in that beyond just the data. I invite, right. others, invite others to answer that question as well. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to think about that mix of culture and structure and in that case. Yeah, any additions in the case of Hawaii? Um, so maybe let's turn globally. Al Sadiq, I'll, I'll give this one to you, but what about some of the global trends? Why do Nordic countries, and you mentioned New Zealand, um, kind of came up on top for the first time this year. Why are they always scoring so well? What, what stands out? Well, it, it's a very similar trend to the U.S. Uh, I, I think one of the, uh, I want to draw attention to the uh, audience that oftentimes uh, uh, the design of laws and public policy, what it drives uh, either phenomena of inclusion or uh, marginality, and it's very consistent in the history of the Nordic countries. Uh, that's for at least for the last hundred years, they've been consistent attempt to develop very strong uh, social welfare state. And also uh, extreme uh, uh, sensitive gender policy in the positive terms. And what that does, because you don't have to do everything good in all the domains or indicators, but if you do in substantial ones, you could actually sh see outcome positive in other areas. I will stick with the issues of uh, uh, closing the gender gap, for example. The more you do that in any given society, the most likely you further something else in, in that society, for example, uh, uh, labor force, uh, political representations. And, and, and over time, we've been seeing through studies that women, for example, have more uh, uh, sensitive, positive position toward uh, 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 accepting refugees and resettlement, for example. So all this will does, by, by doing one thing, a country designs social policies and laws, it does something in one domain and have a reverberation in other domains. But, but uh, we cannot just say this is accidental. It's, I think, by design of, of, of uh, leader of those uh, countries, they did something very substantial. Like New Zealand, for example, escaped the, the way in which that uh, vilify uh, newcomer, uh, being hospitable, being more tolerant country in terms of religion's difference. Uh, but that's also, I want to just caution that that doesn't mean all these countries are really perfect. They have also their own, suffer from own uh, social ills. But when you compare them with other countries, you find them really stand out. And this is what the power 
of the inclusiveness index is to show that beyond economic and GDP, the, the power of inclusion uh, to move the needle of inclusion is reside within the design of laws and public policy that gears toward uh, holistically to, to the whole society and to uplift the most vulnerable in our society. When you do that, whether you are a state or you are a country, uh, you, you will see the result immediately. And I will close with this. Sometimes it just takes years uh, to see the positive in the country that we see. And so, for example, if we see a phenomenon right now, it might not be captured by our index because we have to look back in the data either last year or up to five years in the past. I, I just want to add uh, one more thing to what Al-Sadiq said uh, with an example. Uh, Norway, for instance, is has consistently ranked higher, I think, in the top three uh, rankings. But if you look at the trends, you'll see that it has ranked high in most of these categories, except the religion uh, dimension. Uh, so what Al-Sadiq said that, you know, all the countries which are ranked as highly inclusive have their own set of problems, it's not that they are perfect. So we need to look at this index with a grain of salt and understand that we are not trying to get a perfect index. We are trying to get to something that is uh, easily digestible, it's, it's valuable, and you know, set out those criteria that I talked about at the beginning of the session. Right, yeah, that's a helpful caveat, Samir, not to think of it as totally comprehensive, but as a, as a space to, to start and advance conversations. Um, and yeah, it's interesting, this theme of like the staying power of culture and past um, policy, and also kind of the disruptive nature of new political wins, like we were talking about ethno-nationalism um, being one that's starting to show up in the data. Um, we'll move into some of our last couple of prepared questions. And then I know uh, folks in the chat have had, have had a lot of questions, um, which is great. Please keep them coming. Um, so how can a state or country improve its ranking? I know we've talked a little bit about some of the standout uh, metrics for a certain state, but are there any that you want to maybe point us out to that are more trends across the board um, of how a state or country might improve its ranking? I think uh, in the general terms, uh, like I stated earlier, is the design of those type of laws on, on, on social policy. And we see, we saw without any exceptions, when a country does that, it definitely move ahead or it stay in, in top ranking. When country remain uh, locked down in, in the bottom of the index, we see the same trend. So there is, a, there is no way for a country to move in our index in any further unless they make an improvement in their laws and social policies that kept the marginalized uh, people uh, at the lower place or out of sight, you know? And you can take any examples. But again, I just want to say one thing that uh, we work with data collected by others and by ourselves. So the, what I'm trying to say, the index is not perfect for that reason, for imperfection of data collections, what type of uh, uh, biases existed in, 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 in data outside of our control. So I'll give you an example uh, of a country that are doing so well, but unfortunately locked down. Uh, maybe two countries, one of them is Rwanda and the second is Costa Rica. And, and there is a reason for that in my personal opinion that's uh, the way in which people from outside look into the inside and gathering data. In the case of Rwanda, for example, make a lot of progress in social policies. In, in, for example, in gender, it remain one of the top country if you look by subgroups. It's, it's very impressive for a country to come out in the last 25 years out of uh, massive genocide to move ahead in, in terms of uh, closing the gender gap. But the way in which we perceive Rwanda from outside maybe locked Rwanda in terms of data gathering that Rwanda actually does not recognize tribes and clans, which is cause the, the genocide. But still, we remain outside. We looked at them as, you know, who's people in power, uh, influential that belong to that particular tribe. So we designated the connotation to them, the identity issue, you know, uh, and, and that's what uh, became imperfect in a sense of the case of Rwanda. 
And I, I'll just add to that uh, and, and answer your question as well, Emrit, that any country or US state can improve its ranking by enacting policies that are inclusive of race, ethnicity, gender, LGBTQ community, um, and all those uh, dimensions that we mentioned. And we have seen that the countries which have actually moved up in the ranking, they can attribute that to the changing political, social, and cultural environment uh, through progressive policies and investing in people. For example, if uh, you know if the administrative units, whether it's U.S. states or or nation states, uh, they actually uh, promote or accept transgender rights, they are actually exemplifying their role in the society, saying that they are equally valued, and and this, that helping co-create a healthy and inclusive communities. So it's very important that these policies are very carefully looked at and ensure that all these different uh, communities are equally valued. Thank you both. Um, I think we're going to turn to questions from our audience because we've had several come our way. So here's one from Mia or, or Maya. Thank you for, for being here. Thanks for your question. Uh, how can or should one use the accessible and interactive aspects of the inclusiveness index as an educational tool? Can this be integrated well into the classroom? I, I definitely think so. Um, so one thing you could do is you could imagine, you could structure a classroom discussion or even a, homework assignments or even research assignments. So you could have students select specific countries or US states and then write a summary of what the inclusiveness index says about them and why states are ranked where they are and how they've changed over time. So you, I think you, know, you could just have, if you have a 30 student classroom, you could have a student pick a state or a nation state and just write a summary on why it's ranked where it is. And then you could potentially have, do, have them do research papers, you know, look into newspaper clippings, look into policy changes that, could, that undergird the data. Um, the, um, this is a weighted variable index, meaning that we weight variables differently within the index and we've made changes. Every, most weighted variable indices like this, you, you improve them, you tweak them over time, um, but you can download the data um, on our website. Samir, can you share how, to, how, to, how people can access that? Sure, uh, there's a resource tab on your right side on the website and under the resource tab, you can see data sets that we have for, for all the years, starting 2016. So one can download that data and work with it. Mm -hmm. I believe the link has been in the chat floating around. So make sure to grab that. But yeah, I think that's a great example and um, connecting it also to news stories and kind of the underlying themes that we've talked about today is how politics obviously impacts all of this. Um, would be really interesting in a classroom setting. Could I add, I mean, uh, one of the questions that came up I see is, are the indicators weighted equally? No, actually we, we try and equally weight the domains, not the indicators within them. So if one domain has five indicators and another has two, then the, indicator, the domain with five indicators within that domain, each of those indicators has a smaller overall weight on the ultimate index score. Samir, I believe that's correct. Please correct me if that's wrong. That's correct. Perfect, yeah, thanks for answering that. And, um, and just in terms of data, it's really important to emphasize that we're constrained, right? We're constrained by the data that exists in the world. You know, we need consistent and reliable data reported for every country in order to get them into the, into the index. And they're just, it doesn't really exist, which is why you know, we're very happy that we can get 100, oh, nearly 140 countries into our index, but it's a huge challenge. It's less of a challenge in the United States where data is more consistently reported across the country for each of these domains. Just wanted to mention that as well. Yes, thanks for that. That actually ties to a question that was floating. Oh, here we go. Um, so for example, people notice there's a couple of countries that are missing. Cuba is being pointed out here. Why is Cuba not included? Um, there's a reference to a new family code that was passed recently um, and, you know, maybe trying to understand how that, wishing that could be reflected in, in the index. But uh, yeah, what, what do y'all think about this? 
I think I can feel the first question if someone else can feel the second one. Uh, the data question, uh, as Steve was mentioning, that we are trying to get data from as many sources as possible. Data is sometimes available for all countries, sometimes it's not available, and it's uh, available for a select set of countries, but not all. So we have had this challenge uh, ever since. We try and dig into all kinds of data sources available, and, and you know, we reach out to not only the established data sources like World Bank and uh, UN data sources, we also look at you know, advocacy groups, research organizations that are collecting this data. For example, for the um, political representation uh, by LGBTQ plus community, uh, there's a advocacy and research um, website called Queer Politics. And it's run by Professor Andrew Reynolds from Princeton University. And we approached him and said, you collect such valuable data. Can we have that data? And he was gracious enough to share that. And likewise, we have you know, access data from UNHCR. We have access data from um, you know, many other uh, institutions. For US, we have uh, access data for, from uh, you know, um, not just uh, census, but also from Bureau of Justice Statistics. We have access data from Center for American Women in Politics from Rutgers University. And we also tapped into our own data source on you know, anti-Sharia law, uh, something that Al Sadiq is uh, collecting and working on. So we look at all these different uh, data sets and try to comprehensively get everything together. Now, one country or a set of countries dropping off is because we might be missing data or on one or more indicators. So even if there's one indicator missing, we really can't compare that country with other countries or other one state with other states because there's one data missing, um, data point missing rather. So I think that's one of the reasons why Cuba is, is not in the, in the index. And as you can see, out of these 250 different states and, uh, and, and regions, countries and regions, we have index on 136 countries. It's huge. I mean, when we started off, we could get data only for 120 countries, but we have constantly been looking out for data and managed to gather data for 136, which is quite a feat. But it's just that there are some countries which don't have consistent data across indicators, across domains, across years. Thank you, Samir. Yeah, I think this is hitting a couple of different questions folks have had around data gaps and how that interacts with the index. Um, here's a question from Angelica. Interested to hear how countries with lower racial diversity like Sweden is able to jump to the top. What are the parameters based around racial metrics? I will take a stab at that. I, I think that's one of the things that we, we mentioned. The, the, the more the country is less diverse, most likely will have uh, less racial tension. That doesn't mean the country have good racial policy, right? Um, uh, in the case of Sweden or others. And that also doesn't mean that there is no um, uh, uh, group in that particular country racially charged or the current trend we see today, how um, uh, racial tension could be uh, used as uh, weaponized as a, in political campaigns, especially in the case of Sweden, for example. Maybe we'll see the trend for the next uh, coming years, unfortunately, that will impact the Swedish society in terms of, of, of inclusion and, and, and get to other different type of uh, uh, cementing marginality toward other groups. So. So I think in the one hand, uh, diversity while is a positive aspect, it, it, it just generate uh, a, a multiple uh, uh, challenge for policy making and for uh, drafting laws if it's not carefully thought out like Samir saying earlier that uh, most likely country will or state country, let's focus on countries, will fall into the trap of uh, marginalized population, whether they intend it or not. So, uh, and at, uh, OBI, we always, as an employment institute, we say that when you target the most vulnerable in your society, most likely will benefit uh, other people in the society as well. So, so we can look at it in the reverse terms. If a country more racially, quote unquote, they say homogenized, but it have a smaller population of, of a diverse group, if we focus on those group, most likely the whole entire society will benefit in terms of inclusion and uh, equity and social progress. And then if I could just add, 
um, it's, it's not specifically answering the question about Sweden's race ranking, but Sweden does a, a, has historically done a phenomenal job of admitting and resettling refugees. So it's far above the world average in, in the index if you click. It also has an incredibly low incarceration rate. So the global average, the world average for incarceration is 170 persons per 100,000. And I mentioned how in the United States, it's it's it was nearly it was actually over 700 per 100,000 in the in the 2000 in the aughts. Sweden's figure for that is 10, 10 people per 100,000 people. So it's not just that Sweden does well along one of these dimensions; it does well along all of these dimensions of inclusion. It has a low incarceration rate. It admits lots of refugees. It has a low Gini coefficient score. It has strong representation, political representation of LGBTQ people. Um, it has a strong enforcement of gender rights and, and strong representation of women in, in elected bodies, um, which is one of the indicators we look at and which is one of the indicators that Rwanda does well on. So it just does really well across the board. Yeah, thank you for, for bringing some of the other indicators into play for that answer. And um, El Sadi, your points around kind of like the exponential power of structural protections for the most marginalized is interesting to think about in these cases of, I think someone mentioned it as like race countries or states with more racial homogeneity um, and just thinking about how the, it has these effects and positive impacts for people who might not be in the out group. Uh, we've got a question here from TJ. What examples are there of activists or can activists use the inclusion index in a particular state, especially when it comes to race and disability factor to address inequities. So kind of thinking about back to that theme of how we want this to be a tool for advocates, for activists, what are some examples? Or it could even be if we haven't seen it yet, what we would wish to see, go for it. Yeah, I, I think I think it's very uh, straightforward the, the the information that Stephen and Samir shared earlier that uh, when you go to especially in, within the United States if you go to the state and click in, uh, in 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 the indicator and to see the the trend of 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 of, uh, of a particular your state let's assume because we focused earlier in in Hawaii for example like what Hawaii does bad what what activists think that should improve to uh, make Hawaii even better. And, and you can see over time what that indicator when it's falling down and you compare that what in the ground as an activist or organizer, what was happening at that time? Why that's falling? So I'm very sure you will find a very specific set of policies that implemented and caused this, maybe implemented a year before and caused that drop down. And that could uh, sound the alarm for activists because that's our goal to use this as a diagnostic tool to see where we are falling and we could pick up and push back in, in terms of uh, public policy and laws uh, to improve uh, the ranking or to improve the situation. So uh, people in the local uh, uh, or in the ground, they actually can use this tool very effectively uh, and even could challenge uh, our team to say, while this ranking is high, we think it's bad in terms of this and that, and to bring it to our attention. And that we ask the audience that we are far from perfect, but the contribution of observation and people on the ground to help us tremendously, but we can just not rely on sentiments or particular uh, uh, thing. We need also to access data. And an activist organizer could fill that gap, as Samir mentioned earlier, because it's not just based on a state, collection that could, could be developed through an institution like ours uh, to collect certain data and certain specific examples. I hope that answers your question, TJ. Um, and I, I just want to add a very small comment, an overarching comment, which is that a conscious effort to reduce othering and promote belonging should be the, the goal. That is how you can make these societies more inclusive. Um, on another note, Emily, I think we, we missed responding to one question that came up earlier about Cuba's, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a policy that was enacted recently. And I would just uh, say that, you know, our, our index, 
uh, as Stephen was mentioning earlier, there is a certain lag in the data. So something that's being enacted now will feature either in the next or the future years. But what, what we are getting right now is the data from previous years. So there's definitely a lag, but I think there's a, there's a general trend as to where we are going. So if the, if the society is actually improving and making enacting policies which are beneficial to these groups, it'll certainly show up uh, as an improvement. Uh, let me give you another example. For, for example, India, uh, they, in the last couple of years, they have removed Article 370, which was, dis, uh, which was criminalizing homosexuality. So India has actually improved its ranking in the LGBTQ domain. But overall, we see what's going on. And, you know, there's, there's a you know, deterioration in, in, in religious cohesion and there's a, a increased gender-based um, uh, discrimination and violence. And so the, the country ranking ref reflects what is happening in these different domains. But again, this is all kind of, uh, there's a lag data because of which you don't see the policies that are being enacted currently showing up on the index. Thank you for, for clarifying that. I think actually it's, it's in concert with another question here from Luna. Um, quantitative research methods are snapshots in time. Is not the collection of qualitative data as important and provides more comprehensive data? Maybe speak about the, the relationship between the two. Yeah, let me let me try and address this question. So the original version of the index, the first five years, were not a web-based interactive tool. We had a PDF report that was beautifully designed. Our communications team did a phenomenal job. And we had a section in it called themes and findings that was explicitly designed to be more qualitative. It was designed to be narrative, qualitative, and complementary, and make the index more of a mixed methods tool. Um, but the problem is that the qualitative components didn't necessarily sync up with the quantitative components. And <laughs> the, the team eventually decided that we wanted to make it more interactive, and therefore we leaned into the quantitative component and made the index a web-based tool rather than a report. But the other piece of it is that think about how many countries we're including in this index, 136. To really get qualitative data, we would need to run or piggyback on other people running surveys or other qualitative data collection methods for all of those countries, which would entail logistics of designing the survey, implementing the survey, getting representative samples of the survey, translating it into different languages and cultural contexts, which would be enormous amount of work. And I just don't think that would be possible for us to do. So we are just collecting data that exists and is reported at the global level, either by nation states or the UN or advocacy organizations and building that into the index. It's just not possible to really create a, a strong mixed methods quant and qualitative tool in the way that Luna is sort of suggesting. I, I think we would all agree, yes, that qualitative data is as important and would contribute to a comprehensive data perspective, but the effort and logistics needed to do that are just way beyond our capacity. It would probably cost tens of millions of dollars to do that for 136 countries. And I guess if if I may, uh, Emnet, to add to what Stephen says, that's very true because we try both. But I think our our our, our we 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 lean into providing uh, this kind of consortium of data to show something is to invite researcher and scholar and activists and organizer actually to take this and to to uh, to build it into their own uh, context and locale, you know. And that's the importance of providing this data, this type of uh, work, because when uh, the team said seven years, eight years ago, we felt there is a gap in understanding uh, inclusivity and marginality. So how we can aid researchers and even you know, uh, encourage policymakers to do well in certain domains if they know the complexity and the comprehensive and holistic approach to certain set of policies. While we agree that uh, we would love to do quantitative, qualitative work, but it's just extremely, extremely, I'm not saying difficult, it's almost impossible uh, for uh, uh, a small team like ours. And that's the reason why you can only run it by uh, 
focusing one trend on another, but uh, that doesn't diminish, uh, of course, the quantitative analysis. But we are appealing to the audience here that to use this as a part of the Barsha to discuss those type of issues and why they see some certain trends uh, dragging countries down or moving some uh, state up. Thank you. Yes, I know folks have been thinking about and asking additional questions around qualitative research and have been giving some examples of narrative. I think it's, it's cool to think about how this can be a tool that folks use to do that work um, independently or in, in coalition with others. Um, well, we're close to closing out here, so keep the questions coming. I think we'll be able to get one or two more. We'll take this one from David next. Um, are there a few positive and or more concerning trends or commonalities you're seeing internationally? We touched on a couple of trends, but if we, yeah, can we talk about any to wrap us up? I mean, if if uh, uh, Samir and Stephen doesn't have want to speak to it, but uh, I mean, always we see positive, but uh, the negative, unfortunately, is daunting. You know, from from restricting restricting people movement, especially refugees and resettlement, uh, and displace uh, forcibly displaced person. But we see a very good trends as well in in some countries and state try to uh, reform their, uh, for example, policy in relation to uh, 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 gender, but it's also people with disability. So, and it depends, I mean, but the general terms, I think uh, uh, political representation by, by women and minority group increasing over time, not in everywhere, but that's kind of the general positive things we see. The most daunting one is the rise of internationalism and close off uh, society from, uh, different parts of the world. And we see it today played out and unfortunately maybe tomorrow too. And that could be judgmental and really big uh, hurdle to uh, achieve any progress in terms of inclusion. And, just, and just to add to that, uh, uh, you're right, Al Sadiq. We, we have seen you know, countries and US state val values going up and down. It all depends on what's going on in each of these administrative units. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it'll be helpful to just look at, um, is, is the, um, you know, uh, are we becoming more inclusive globally? Are we becoming more inclusive, uh, you know, uh, within the nation? Those trends would be very helpful, but because of these changes, changing circumstances, policies that come in and, you know, that, or the political change that happens within a country or within the US, that always impacts the overall index. So. I think going forward, maybe we can look at that. We have, we have actually planned out some uh, offshoot exercises just to look at some trends, uh, but on the onset, it might be hard. Thank you. Thank you for adding, Samir. I think we are going to wrap up with one last question. We'll get it up on the screen um, for the data nerds in the audience. Do you exist? Do you examine the statistical variability of your data sources? Um, this question, this audience member, Wesley, is noting that they didn't see any error bars. Do you examine statistical trends and significance, particularly over time? I'll pass this one to you, Samir, as you and the equity metrics team um, probably put plenty of thought into this. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a, a tough one. We have actually looked at, uh, as Asai was mentioning earlier, we rely on data collected by other organizations. So we actually depend on you know, the, the quality of the data. And certainly the quality of the index depends on the input that goes into it. So if the data is good, the data is strong, uh, you can expect a better outcome. Uh, we have kind of looked into the, uh, we have actually employed some statistical methods to get to this, uh, to the index. We have used comparative analysis, trying to see how far each data point is from the mean value. Uh, in technical terms, you've used z-score to try to get to that. And, uh, you know, but, but going forward, we, we will try and do that and try and get deeper into this and trying to see if, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's more statistical evidence. Um, uh, but overall, I think looking at the trends over the past seven years, we know that we, the data inputs are great and the output actually, uh, you know, gives you a trend 
that is uh, interesting and usable. Thank you, Samir. Samir, do, do you wanna, well, just also, this is not a sampling, right? These are complete, whatever data source we input is the comprehensive source. So the, the variability, you know, we could probably generate some error bars, but it's not a sampling technique <laughs> that would necessarily come with that kind of information. Uh, Samir, did you want to close by acknowledging some of the people who helped contribute? Absolutely. Um, I just want to thank uh, my team members, uh, Eve, uh, who is a data scientist with the Equity Metrics team, uh, Shahan, uh, Shahid, uh, and Marina. Uh, Shahan is a current GSR, and Marina was an ex GSR. So they've helped tremendously and contributed a lot to the development of this index. Yes, thanks for that shout out and acknowledging um, this is a massive effort. I think people in the audience have been pointing that out as we dive into the work. Um, so it's a huge team, actually quite a small team for how much work has gone into this. So very impressive. Um, but just thank you everyone for your time. Um, the audience members for being so interactive and great with all your comments. And even if we didn't get to everything, we hope this is you know a chance for dialogue with other audience members and I think I've heard a theme from our panelists today that there's a lot like an invitation to give us feedback, to send ideas our way. So please feel free to continue doing that. And thanks for your time. And thanks to our three panelists um, for sharing about this work. Have a great afternoon all.